Before ye begins, this video is christened by Harry's. If you want to finally define your mustache and cheekbones with an inexpensive, comfortable clean shave like Robbie Pattinson and avoid the barking, disheveled, wet dog look of Willem Dafoe, then what ye need is a bleared by Harry's. <laughs> I, I can't keep that voice up forever. Anyway, as someone with sensitive skin and typically cuts his face up with the blade with cheap disposable crap, Harry's simple, elegantly efficient razor has allowed me to avoid further rashes and blood loss. And with refills starting at just $2 that get shipped right right to your doorstep, it saves me a hell of a lot of time and money from venturing out into the hellish Irish storms during the approaching winter season. Harry's is a 100% money back guarantee and have just came out with their sharpest blade ever at no additional cost. So if you want to try it for yourself and help out the channel, I suggest redeeming your trial set at just $3 by going to harrys.com slash ryanh or Willem Dafoe will cursedly strike you down. So what are ye waiting for? Go get your starter kit today and join the 10 million other souls who tried Harry's for themselves and let me, let me know what you think. Oh my goodness. All right, and now let's talk about the lighthouse. It has been one year since the release of Robert Eggers' extraordinary classical horror The Lighthouse, and at this point everybody and their mother has practically talked about all the symbiology, allegories, and biblical and mythological metaphors that there really isn't anything left for me to add, so all I can say is… go watch their videos. Okay, thanks for watching, here's your weekly dose of me saying however, now I stay safe and I'll see you all next week, bye! Alright, so I told myself I wouldn't cover The Lighthouse for this very reason. It's a film that is being picked to death like a seagull pestering Robbie Pattinson, and I just don't want to end up regurgitating all the same stuff about Greek mythology and Prometheus, etc, etc, and so on. It does nothing for me unless I want to kiss my own ass, and it does nothing for you because there are countless videos and discussions already out there. Although I do highly recommend Acolytes of Horror's 42 minute video on it, because I think it's probably the closest to my analytical interpretation had I reviewed it upon release. Personally, I find it is more sincere to just openly embrace the unknown and interpret the material based on your own knowledge and experiences before applying secondhand analysis to appreciate the film on a deeper artistic and intellectual level. My belief is that these kinds of films work best when you look inside yourself to uncover real and honest feelings rather than immediately seek a rudimentary explanation because you can't comprehend not having answers. Dan Olson perfectly summarized my feelings on this in his video on Annihilation, so I'm not going to step on his toes regarding the broader issue, but my general ethos is this. If you want to engage with unconventional storytelling to understand it, explanations are fine to give you a basis to work off or supplement what you watched, but don't let them be the sole determinant to how you think and feel about art. And the same goes for listening to any film critic or knobhead like myself. While these kinds of stories are created to be entertaining first and foremost, they are typically developed from self-reflection. Nobody holds the definitive answer, not even the creator. Sure, they inject their own feelings and experiences into it, but once their work is out there, it's no longer theirs to control, and it's open to anybody to interpret it how they see fit because, well, emotions are subjective and we all experience things differently. I like to cook it. So while watching The Lighthouse, it was natural for me to put myself in the shoes of Pattinson's character Winslow, to seek a greater level of empathy and relatability that invites the film to speak to me on a more personal level. I celebrate horror the way that I do through these videos because I find that confronting fear, letting my mind wander, and accepting moments of vulnerability and confusion have a remarkably therapeutic effect on me. 
While I still love to celebrate the zany, schlocky side of the genre because obviously it's fun, I still think the darker, more inherently painful and ambiguous side of horror has its fair share of positive qualities to unearth, especially if they encourage you to confront things that you would rather repress or avoid. By the way, I'm not advocating this as something for everyone because we all have our own personal thresholds, but to put this into context, The Lighthouse had a strangely welcoming allure to its horror, thanks in large part to Pattinson and Defoe's eccentric performances and Edgar's oddball sense of humour that synergizes wonderfully with the increasing madness. However, because I was injecting so much of my identity and ego into Winslow, who I relate to as a quiet, introverted man withholding a tremendous amount of frustration, anger and confusion in life, of course it transcended beyond just being a brilliantly entertaining film and became more tender and heartfelt and all the other words the internet won't allow you to say because you're just being pretentious. Anyway, I know it sounds cliche to interpret two characters as the same person, but considering the film's persistent purgatorial and otherworldly tone, there's a considerable provocativeness to be found in treating Winslow as an isolated man simply struggling with a metaphorical identity and existential crisis in the form of Willem Dafoe's Thomas Wake, a domineering, intrusive old man who seems to be watching and scrutinising Winslow's every move before eventually pressuring Winslow's emotions out of him. <laughs> Again, I could go into the whole Greek mythology and its mirrored imagery with historical paintings and so on, but that doesn't speak to me personally. Instead, it reminded me of a story my late English teacher told our class in first year high school. One night, an everyday innocuous man like you or I went to bed and woke up the very next day to find his body morphed into that of an insect. Now, being the gullible little shits that we were, naturally we all believed it, yet the classroom retrospectively turned into a relatively thoughtful discussion about identity, fear, existence and dysmorphia, which as 11-12 year olds wasn't exceptionally profound because we were still too young to totally understand thematic storytelling, but nonetheless, we all went home that night, googling this supposedly true story, and we all came back the very next day having been tricked into doing our first ever truly independent piece of research. Our teacher had just introduced us to reflexive analysis through the vision of Franz Kafka's 1915 novella The Metamorphosis, where our protagonist Gregor Samsa tries to adjust to his life as an insect, until it burdens his family to the point of wanting nothing to do with him, to which he crawls into the dark, cold isolation of his room and willingly dies of starvation so he can no longer burden them. There are a lot of ways you can interpret the metamorphosis, but for our class, and for me personally, it was the first real mature experience of questioning and challenging things as more than just the sum of their parts. I have struggled with depression for the better part of a decade now, and it has a pretty dominant effect on my relationship with others, my work, and just trying to live a normal life in general. But when I get low, I always go back to this time because now when I see portrayals of guilt, grief, anxiety, alienation, and depression in different horror scenarios, it gives me a strange sense of ease. Even even if it isn't explicitly about those themes, but at least mirrors those feelings in a visually profound way. If it was not for my English teacher's pretty clever method of inspiring self-reflection, I don't think I would ever look at horror or appreciate the genre the way that I do. I think it's because when we see such complex, confusing emotions expressed so vividly in a way that doesn't simply reduce them to plain sadness or tragedy, we no longer feel alone in our thoughts and find gratification in it. 
Even if it doesn't lead to a happy or fulfilling conclusion, it does help us somewhat cope with it when it happens in real life. Like the sudden passing off my English teacher in my final year of high school, which was my first real experience of death. In Winslow's story, he's persistently tormented by Wake, a man who manifests not only the obvious divine father figure, but also this self-imposed oppression. Winslow is fighting back against an inferiority complex, a constant part of his brain that tells him he's useless, problematic, and undeserving of love. It's an obscure amalgamation of negative experiences that have turned into this unclear, ever-changing figure of fear and uncertainty. In the Metamorphoses, like Winslow, there's nothing about Gregor that's elaborately flawed or tragic. Both men are a representation of an everyday inner battle of self-worth and judgement. Neither man ever outwardly shows their doubts or fears. In fact, both men are pretty content with their lives, bar personal troubles that almost all of us deal with in different ways. But in Gregor's case, his transformation into an insect comes to symbolise his avoidance and repression of trouble, like how Wake's eventual shape-shifting omnipresent appearance becomes an embodiment of Winslow's psyche. They both realise they are incapable of honestly expressing who they truly are. That inability to communicate emotional needs, especially to loved ones, eventually mutates into an allegory of the gradual dehumanisation people feel in a time of anguish, especially when their problems become burdensome to others. In Winslow's case, he tries to run and isolate himself away from something that's not for the audience to know. Hell, the fact that we don't really get a clear picture of Winslow's past other than he changed his identity is a powerful reinforcement of how often we all hide our anguish, and for some, just a little too well. Sure, he's angry and defensive, but it's projected onto himself, assuming Wake is still treated as a metaphor for his emotional disposition. Wake is the one who breaks him, the guilt-tripping trickster side of the brain that threatens to expose who he really is, even though he's not done anything wrong. There's just this void of guilt and insecurity that makes Winslow feel uncomfortable with himself. Naturally, since we're trapped in Winslow's shoes, the world revolves around him and his ego, thus calling back to how I channel my own personal intimacy into his story. At the end of the day, knowing what Wake is hiding from Winslow at the top of the lighthouse is a motive that's made redundant in trying to explain it. It's a film plainly about a man alone with his thoughts, and using his work as the sole distraction to repress them. Them, only for him to end up back face to face with his internal tormentor after the day is over, and soon ends up drowning his sorrows in alcohol. Eventually, Winslow does confront it, but instead of learning to live with it or overcome it, he literally buries those feelings, and while he thinks he's taken back control of his life and is able to finally seek the embrace of the light, it breaks him mentally again, and he ends up back where he started. In this final scene, I find myself saying yes. This is what a nervous breakdown looks like. It's a nasty fall into utter hopelessness and self-destruction that leaves you paralysed and a burnt-out husk of your former self, exposed to be packed away at by the world. Since around May, June of this year, despite the state of the world, I've been in the best place mentally I've ever been in a very long time, and I'm grateful I've been able to overcome these experiences that I've described, or at least can better cope with them. 
The thing about genre films like The Lighthouse is that they remind us horror doesn't truly have a face, nor does it ever go away. It's abstract and indecipherable, and will always come in many changing forms. Sometimes you can unmask and defeat it, but other times you just have to learn to live with it and control it, just like you do with your very being. Yes, it might forever be part of you, but it doesn't have to define you. In fact, if it does, it can be a symbol of strength and hope. To those who have sent me private messages over the years, sharing their personal stories and experiences, and saying that understanding horror has helped them cope with the negatives in life, this is for you. While plunging deep into the darkness will always be terrifying, it isn't eternal. You can, over time, make it your own and one day ignite the light that scares off the darkness.